Bueno, vamos a, vamos, vamos a proceder con la segunda parte de la, de la jornada, eh, donde tenemos a, a Nuria Oliver. Me preguntaban si, era, si éramos familia, pero no podemos, podemos confesarlo. ¿no? Somos primos. Somos primos, primos lejanos. ¿Se ¿no? nota? Pero bueno, eh, para mí es un placer digamos, tener a Nuria eh, una vez más en la universidad dando una charla. Ella es eh, directora científica de Telefónica y más de aquí en Barcelona. La charla se va a impartir en inglés y, bueno, Nuria, adelante. Gracias. Gracias por la invitación, Miquel, y por la organización de estas jornadas. Uh, now I'm going to switch to English, because they asked me to give the talk in English. And the slides are also in English. Um, my name is Nuria Oliver, and I'm scientific director of a research team in Telefónica R&D here in Barcelona. And today I'm going to talk about how we are using mobile phone data Uh, in different areas and particularly in the public sector. I'm not touching on education though, which is the topic for most of the sessions before, but I'm going to cover different aspects. In particular, how mobile phone data can help in official statistics, in urban planning, in security and crime, and in public health. And then I'll highlight some of the opportunities that we see, but also the many challenges that there are to be able to use this data in general and in particular for the public sector, and then some conclusions. But before I start, I thought that it might be useful to you, particularly to the PhD students, to hear a little bit about the research team that we have here in Barcelona. So this is our building. It's next to Diagonal Mar, uh, next to the Forum building. And the research organization in Telefónica is about 20 uh, full-time researchers. We are about eight, nine years old, and we are divided into two big functional areas, and I'm responsible for one of the areas. We have a very um, successful internship program whereby PhD students from anywhere in the world, but also locally, can come and do a, an internship with us for three to six months and work with the researchers on a research project. And we also have some uh, visiting professors and an open innovation approach, and we are hiring And uh, my last slide is actually the URL for our hiring site in case you are graduating and you're interested in joining the lab after you hear what we do. In my um, research areas, I'm responsible for a multidisciplinary research team that I came here to create. And we work on a variety of areas uh, from machine learning, data analysis, human computer interaction. And the main theme of everything that we do is building computational models of human traits or human behavior, either individually or aggregated, from a variety of data. So we can build models from voice. In the past, we have done from video and images, from mobile data, from services data, that, uh, from uh, Telefónica services, for example, um, etc. These are some of the areas that we cover. I don't have time to describe a lot of these areas today, so I'm just going to focus mainly on the areas related to aggregate analysis, but we're doing a lot of work on the individual modeling, including uh, recommender systems, as I mentioned, voice analysis, and human-computer interaction. We have uh, a lot of external visibility for being such a young, in quotes, and, and uh, a small team, so we've generated a lot of patents, we've gotten a lot of uh, awards, and we've also appeared a lot in the press, our projects, so we're very, uh, happy and proud about this. So without further ado, I'm just going to describe these four areas where mobile phone data can have an impact on the public sector. And um, Before going into the areas, I thought that I would first give a quick primer on what is the mobile data that I'm talking about. So why are we interested in mobile data and why is mobile data useful to model large-scale human behavior? So the main reason is because there are more phones in the world than people. Uh, in fact, the uh, mobile phone penetration ranges worldwide between uh, about 90% and 120%. In addition, we love our phones. We carry our phones with us all the time, even when we are sleeping many times. And this is very important because it is a sensor and it's a computer that is connected and that is always with us. And the other very important factor, particularly for large scales of like computational sociology projects is that this is a global phenomenon that happens both in developing countries and in developed economies. And you don't need to have a smartphone to be able to uh, leave these traces of data behind. So as a result, there is a new area 
called computational social sciences, which is focusing on modeling large scale human behavior using this kind of data because we leave these digital traces behind and then the idea is to be able to analyze uh, those digital traces. In fact, two years ago, in 2013, MIT Technology Review named this area of analyzing human behavior from mobile data one of the breakthrough technologies. And the United Nations, with whom we are collaborating actively for the past couple of years, it is calling right now for a data revolution because they realize that this data is extremely powerful to help them make better decisions uh, to improve the world. So what is this data about? So I'll just quickly show you how the data looks like. Have you ever worked with mobile data, any of you? No? Okay. So this is how a mobile phone would see a city. And this is a simplification. But usually what you do is there are a lot of cell towers or base stations. And uh, we can do a Voronoi tessellation, which is these uh, pink lines here. And then in the center of each of these cells, there would be a cell tower. And this region would be the area of coverage of the cell tower. And then in each of the cell towers, there is some information that is being registered every time a phone makes or receives a phone call or sends or receives an SMS. And this data is uh, traditionally called call detail records. It is all anonymized. All the personal information is encrypted. But it still is it's quite valuable data when you can do aggregated analysis. So because there is a lot of uh, data from a lot of people. Typically, um, from this data, we can compute variables of three types. You can compute what is called consumption variables, which characterize how many phone calls are happening, how many incoming phone calls, how many outgoing phone calls, what is the duration of those phone calls. You can compute some social network features because you can build what is called the call graph, which is the graph of all the phones that call each other. And from there, you can apply network science to compute some characteristics of that network. And then you can compute some rough, not very precise mobility features, because we are not talking about GPS precision at all. We are talking about this, the granularity of these uh, cells that I uh, showed before. But you can infer some characteristics, such as the distance traveled, or the most popular antennas, or uh, the radius of gyration, which is the radius of a circle or a circumference that would like cover most of the uh, traveling areas. I'm just going to show you a couple of videos to illustrate how this data looks like. The first video shows the uh, activity in the different cell uh, towers in a state of uh, Oaxaca in Mexico right before, during, and after an earthquake takes place. Each of these bubbles is proportional the size to the amount of phone calls that are connected to that tower. So just by looking at that, we can um, see this data as a sensor of how many people are roughly in each of the areas. So you can see this is a more populated area. This was where the earthquake took place. And then suddenly, there is this surge of, of activity. And by looking at how many phone calls are connected to each of the towers, we can have a proxy of how many people are roughly in those areas. And this is extremely valuable, because if there is a, a natural disaster like this one, we can help the Red Cross, or we can help the government tell them, OK, this area you know, is very populated. There's a lot of people here, and there aren't that many people here. So they can uh, determine how much help to send. If we look at the mobility between the phones, then you know, we can see how, you know, where the main cities are, how people are traveling between the main cities. This is in the UK, and even like how they're going to Northern Ireland. So just by looking this, at this very aggregated and anonymized data, we realize that there is a lot of valuable information that can help, uh, particularly the public sector, which is the purpose of this uh, presentation. So as I mentioned, there is an entire research area comput called computational social sciences on how to use this data as social sensors. And there is a lot of work. And there has been work on um, monitoring mobility, understanding pandemics, which I will present later, inferring socioeconomic indicators, uh, inferring different traits. And a lot of these papers are actually papers coming from uh, my research team. In fact, we have a, a, a research area within the team, which we call Big Data for Social Good, where, as I mentioned, we are working with the United Nations or with MIT or with some governments to see how we can help them make better decisions thanks to the existence of this data. 
So now I'm going to quickly present four projects that I think can illustrate the value of this data in the public sector. And the first area where I think we can tremendously help is for official statistics. So official statistics are statistics that are generated typically by governments and that I try to characterize from a quantitative and qualitative perspective different aspects of people's lives in a certain country or in a certain territory. So many of the variables in official statistics characterize the population, the gender, employment situations, immigration, but also economy, trade, energy, etc. These statistics are usually computed by hand. So countries typically do a census every, typically every 10 years, and it's a very expensive process because they need to ask every single individual in the region to answer these very long questionnaires to collect all these statistics. So the question is, can we leverage the fact that we have all this data to help build more up-to-date and cheaper statistics about you know, a certain region? And the answer is probably yes. And in fact, you know, we have done work in the red area, but there is research by other teams working also on the blue area. And today in particular, I will show an example of how we can use this data to help build better economic socio indicators. And this is the next project, which is, uh, which is work by Vanessa and Enrique Frias in my team. So the challenge, as I mentioned, is related to uh, the construction of census maps and in particular socioeconomic indicators. And this is very relevant uh, in Latin America. So in Latin America, there is a lot of differences between the different socioeconomic levels. Typically, there is a pyramid of socioeconomic levels that goes from A to E or F where the bottom of the pyramid is very big and, and, and is the poorest people, and the top of the pyramid is very small and is the richest people. And um, the socioeconomic indicator is very important because it's usually a proxy for access to education or access to clean water or access to healthcare. So it is very important for the country governments to know what are the different socioeconomic levels of different regions in a country. But as I said, this is a very expensive process and very um, um, difficult to collect and therefore they only computed every few years. So what we did in this project was to see if by having access to the mobile data and characterizing consumption patterns, mobility patterns and social network patterns of each of these different regions in a country, we were able to infer the socioeconomic levels in such a way that the country wouldn't need to, expand, uh, to uh, spend millions of dollars in creating these indicators and also we could compute them every month instead of computing them every 10 years. We knew from previous work that there are already some correlations that have been found. In particular, higher socioeconomic indicators are usually correlated with larger area of mobility. So the richer you are, the more you travel and the further you travel. And conversely, lower socioeconomic indicators are usually correlated with smaller degrees in the social network, which means that the poorer you are, the smaller your social network tends to be. So this is the question that I would like to answer. Can we infer the socioeconomic levels from mobile data? And the answer, uh, as you will see, is yes, with a certain level of uh, accuracy. So the main uh, benefit that we see from this technology would be that the national statistical institutes would only have to carry surveys on a subset of the regions that we can use to train our models. Then we build our models and then we apply those models to unseen regions and um, that you know, we automatically compute the, the economic indicators for. And this is what we did. Uh, the details are in the papers that I will mention later. There are a number of challenges. One of the first ones is that the Voronoi cells that you divide the space on don't map with the census regions. So you need to apply a mapping between the Voronoi cells and the census regions to assign a particular socioeconomic level to a Voronoi cell, to a cell tower. And then, you know, for each of the different cell towers, we compute all the different behavioral variables, consumption variables, mobility variables, and social network variables, and predict the socioeconomic indicators. In order to evaluate it, we had the ground truth data for a particular country, which was the census data. And we took um, about one, two thirds of the data for training and one third of the data for testing. Usually in all these projects, you generate a huge amount of variables. I'm talking about, it depends. In one of the projects that I will present later, we, we generated over 6,000 variables. It could go from a few hundred to a few thousand variables. So it is very important to apply feature selection techniques 
that will automatically determine which ones are the most relevant variables because otherwise uh, you will be overfitting. You will not really be building a model that generalizes. We tried different algorithms and the one that performed the worst was uh, random forests. So when we um, reduce the dimensionality to 38 features, uh, we obtain an accuracy of 82% to estimate um, three socioeconomic indicators. And if we went to six socioeconomic indicators, we got a performance of about 63%. So as I mentioned, the main value for this would be to be able to only collect the indicators for a small uh, part of the country and then infer the rest by using uh, our technology. In terms of which variables matter, something that was very interesting is that mobility seemed to be very important. Four of the top variables uh, were mobility variables, which we knew from previous work, but it was uh, uh, nice to see that we could corroborate previous work, and no one had tried to do this for socioeconomic uh, indicators uh, inference. And then communication and social variables were also important. So the different aspects of human behavior seem to play a role in characterizing the socioeconomic level of a region. The second project is related to urban planning. So I'm presenting all the projects pretty fast and uh, high level. We have papers that describe the details, but I'd rather give you a taste of the different projects. And in particular, within urban planning, the project that I'm going to present is about uh, determining the use of the land, or what is called land use identification. So one of the tasks in urban planning is to know how a particular part of the region is being used. Is this a residential area? Is it an office area? Is it a um, leisure area? Is it an industrial area? Because depending on how it's being used, the town hall or the government decides to build different infrastructures and different services to provide the right services for the people living there. Traditional techniques, again, are based on questionnaires, like for the census, uh, which, again, don't scale and don't allow for a very updated information. So usually the land use information available is again a few years old at the very best. And the question that we wanted to answer is, can we infer how the land is being used by looking at the patterns of activity in the cell towers? So to do that, we could analyze data for cell towers, both in Madrid and in Barcelona. And we had the ground truth from the city of Madrid. Uh, this ground truth was obsolete. It was much older than the data that we had, but that was the only ground truth that we had, so we had to use it to validate uh, the algorithm. So how do we do that? How do we characterize uh, a region? So the main idea here is if you look over a 24-hour period, the number of phone calls that are connected to a particular cell tower, you see a, a specific signature of that cell tower. Here, this is the number of phone calls, and this is the, num the hour from 0 to 24 in a weekday and in a weekend. So as you see, there is no phone calls, no phone calls, no phone calls, and then around the time when people wake up, there are a lot of phone calls, then there is a dip at around lunchtime, then there is another big peak, and then sort of like people, people go to, uh, to their homes. And in the weekends, in this particular cell tower, there is almost no phone calls. So this could suggest that this is a working area, because it seems to match the working hours, and then in the weekends there's no one. This is another example for a different cell tower, which is located in a different place, and as you see, it has a different signature. So then what we did is, for each cell tower, we computed this graph, and then we applied a, a clustering technique, which in this case was spectral clustering, to cluster cell towers that had a similar signature into five different clusters, which were residential, commercial, leisure, nightlife, and industrial. Automatically, the algorithm is able to determine which cell towers are the most similar to which ones and segment the city into these different five clusters. And then we validate it with the real land use. So I'll show you an example of what the algorithm found for the city of Madrid and then very quickly a very short video for the city of Barcelona. So these are four of the clusters in the city of Madrid. So this red cluster represents offices. And as I showed before, the characteristic pattern for this cluster is activity during working hours and no activity in the weekends. And you can even see the street of there here, which is where Telefonica is based. And this is all like the main office areas in Madrid. If we look at the commercial areas, we see that there is activity both in the weekend and in the weekdays. And they have a similar pattern, which this is very typical in human behavior analysis, where there is these two peaks. Usually there is a morning peak, and then there is an afternoon peak. If we look at the nightlife cluster, 
The main difference here is that there is a lot of activity in the weekend and pretty late. This is like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and there is a lot of activity. So this represents the nightlife areas. And then the commercial areas have, you know, their own uh, characteristic. So something that is very interesting is particularly the nightlife areas and the leisure and transport areas, because those areas tend to change relatively quickly. So the information that town halls have because it's only computed every few years, tends to get obsolete you know, very quickly. Whereas with this approach, we can detect you know, on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis where are the main nightlife areas happening. When we validated with the ground truth, which was the data from the city of Madrid, one of the observations is that in the ground truth, uh, official land use ground truth, there is no nightlife. Uh, because they don't have a way to characterize this because, as I said, it changes a lot. So we were able to identify some of what they thought was residential or um, you know, offices as nightlife, as being used as, as nightlife. And I'll very quickly show a video of the same analysis in Barcelona where um, the different colors represent the different clusters. One uh, is industrial, the red one. The orange one would be commercial, the yellow one is nightlife, the light green one is leisure, and the dark green one is uh, residential. So I'll just show very quickly a, a video. So you can see how the area around the airport is automatically detected as industrial. And then there are some pockets of nightlife around downtown. This is mainly residential, but it's able to identify other areas within the city that are used for a different purpose. OK, so this is another, an example of how to use this data for uh, urban planning. The third area where we are finding that we can provide value is in the context of safety and crime. And this is a joint project that we did with the um, FBK, which is a foundation in Italy, and MIT. And it's a project about predicting crime using this kind of data. So crime is being studied a lot because it affects the quality of life of a place. And usually, um, again, uh, mainly city officials and, and governments are very interested in understanding how safe you know, their citizens are or where the crime areas are. There are a lot of studies that are, have found that there are correlations between crime and socioeconomic levels or levels of uh, unemployment or percentages of immigrants, et cetera. And most of the recent studies of crime today don't focus on modeling individuals and determining whether a particular person is going to commit a crime, but they focus on modeling what is called hotspots. So one of the observations is that crime tends to cluster in different geographic spaces. And almost all of you would know that in Barcelona, not all the neighborhoods are equally safe. And there are some neighborhoods that are less safe you know, than others. So why is that? Because crime tends to cluster in these hotspots. So most of the research today in understanding crime is focusing on understanding and finding those hotspots. In terms of theories to explain what contributes to crime, until now, there have been two competing theories. So the first theory was proposed by Jane Jacobs, which was a social activist in the 60s in the US. And she, uh, she wrote a, a book called Eyes on the Street, where what she says is that areas that have a lot of people going through them and they have a lot of diversity of people are safer because there are eyes on the streets and all of us are policing each other. And then you know, if there is a lot of people and I see that someone is being mobbed, I'm going to do something and protect that person. However, about 10 years later, Newman proposed the opposite theory. And he called it the defensible space theory. And he said, no, places that have a lot of people and a lot of diversity of people are more anonymous. And anonymity induces less safety. Because if I know everybody, I'm going to care for them. But if I'm just walking by, I don't know the person, I'm just going to be, OK, it's not my problem, you know, and I'm going to go. So the question is, who is right? Because those two theories are actually conflicting. Uh, in conflict with each other. So in this project, we were able to find some evidence about who is right, but I'm not going to tell you until the end. <laughs> so as I mentioned, uh, we are focusing on a place-centric approach, not on a people-centric approach of how to characterize crime. And this is very important because this project became very popular with the press. And then they were talking about minority report and this and that, and it has nothing to do with minority report. 
Uh, but anyways, so this, the particular study that we did was a study in London, and this was in the context of a datathon that Telefonica organized, where Telefonica shared large-scale aggregated data with research teams from the world, from anywhere in the world, to work on any project, but it had to be for social good. And the winning project was actually this project. And from that, we started working together, and this is the result of the collaboration. The approach is multimodal because we are using people's dynamics based coming from the mobile uh, network data. It's London, and as I said, we're focusing on finding crime hotspots, not criminals, not individuals. In terms of the data that we use for this project, we had three sources of data. So something else that you've probably seen in all the projects that I've mentioned is that these projects are all about combining different sources of data. So we have the human behavioral data coming from the mobile network, but we need the domain data or the ground truth coming from somewhere else. So in the land use, it was coming from the town hall. Here, uh, the criminal cases data set, which has the ground truth of the crimes, was coming from the London police. Uh, in the socioeconomic status project, the ground truth was coming from the census data. So it's very important to, re to understand that in order to solve a real world problem, you need to have the data for the specific domain that you're trying to have impact on, plus the behavioral data that you're using to try to make the inferences. And then to compare with the state of the art, we had the census data. So this is the same data as I presented for the socioeconomic level uh, inference project but for the case of London. So uh, in London, it's called the London Borough Profiles data sets, and it has 68 variables that are census variables for the different uh, neighborhoods in London. The mobile data, as I said, was shared uh, and was coming from a product that Telefonica has uh, in the UK in this, in this case, which is called Smart Steps. And what Smart Steps does is instead of creating a Voronoid tessellation, it creates a grid. And in each of these cells of the grid, you know every hour an approximation of how many people there are, and then what percentage of them, this is their home, this is their work, or neither, home or work, and then a rough approximation of their ages. So what percentage are young, medium age, uh, old, etc. This is what I just explained. The crime data was coming from the London police, and we had two months, so we used one month for training, and one month for testing. And we had all the crimes that took place in that month geolocated. So to define a hotspot, we look at the median value of all the crimes in the month. And then in this case, it was five. And then we just said, OK, if there were more than five crimes in this particular location in this month, that's a hotspot. And there are, if there are fewer than five or five, it's not a hotspot. The spatial granularity, similar to the socioeconomic level project, in, in the case of London, these regions, these census regions, are called LSOA, and they are smaller than a zip code. Uh, there is a picture here. And the way they are defined is they are regions in space that have roughly 1,500 people. Because when they compute the census, they want to be able to have the same number of people so they can compare. So again, we had to find the mapping between the areas of coverage of the cell towers and these census um, um, regions. And the census data, which is the London Borough Profiles data, had 68 variables, which are the census variables. So demographics information, unemployment information, socioeconomic level information, percentage of immigrants, percentage of retired people, et cetera. As I also mentioned, uh, from the mobile data, we computed a huge amount of features. Usually, you compute every possible feature that you can think of and then statistics of those. So first order statistics and second order statistics, et cetera. So we generated over 6,000 features. Something very important to take into account is that all this data is a spatio-temporal data. So a lot of the unknown is what is the right time scale to model the phenomenon that you're trying to model. So usually, you try many different time scales because you don't know what is the underlying right time scale for that phenomenon. So you compute, say, the total number of phone calls every hour, then group by four hours, then group by day, then group by weekdays, then group by you know, the whole week, then group by two weeks, et cetera, because you don't know what is the right time scale. And then you apply feature selection techniques, which in this case we use the Gini coefficient, to select which ones are the most discriminative features. At the end, we selected the top 68 features to be able to compare with the census data, which also has 68 features. 
And so we built three models. We built a model of crime that was using these 68 features coming from the mobile network, a census model or a London borrow model that, was, that had 68 features, but they were coming from the census data, and then the combined model that was using the mobile data with the census data. And this is what we found. Well, in terms of the classification, we just, it's a supervised uh, problem because we have the ground truth. And again, random forest was the best classifier, but we tried a lot of different classifiers on the state of the art. And this is the performance. So we um, built the models using the data from one month, and then we tested using the data from the following month. If we only use a baseline classifier, it has a, a usually the best measure to use is uh, F1 in this case. Um, it's totally random, and it's, uh, actually this should be 0 0.5, which is the equivalent of random. The borrow profiles model is a little bit better than random, 57 or 0 0.57. Using the mobile data, we were significantly better than using the census data. And that was very surprising, in a sense, because the mobile data doesn't have nearly as much detail as the census data. And we, ha we were in 0 0.65. And then combining them, we were in 0 0.67. And if we look at the accuracy, we were almost 70% uh, accuracy. We did a lot of visualizations, even though it doesn't really help a lot here, to see this is the ground truth and this is what the model was saying. But you can see like a lot of the big hotspots are correctly classified. And I mean, it's difficult to see you know, whether it's actually working or not. But uh, uh, by looking at the numbers, roughly with 70% accuracy, we were able to determine whether a particular region of the, uh, London was going to be a crime hotspot or not. So then, as I told you at the beginning, who, who is right? Is Jane Jacobs right? or was uh, Newman's right. So to do that, we looked at the features that were selected by the classifier. And what we found, first of all, in terms of the time scale, we found that daily features were the most discriminatory, better than any of the other time scales. In terms of the features that were important, we found that areas that had an increased ratio of residents had more crime which would be contradicting Newman's theory of the defensible space, where he was saying, if you have a lot of residents, there should be less crime. Moreover, we found that features that were entropy-based features, and entropy measures how predictable uh, a variable is or not, or how easily uh, predictable is, those features were actually correlated with less crime which seems to, again, go against Newman's theory and supporting Jane Jacobs' theory. So from our findings, we have a lot of um, empirical evidence to think that Jane Jacobs was right and Newman's was wrong. And that's why we call this project Moves on the Street instead of Eyes on the Street, because we don't have eyes, but we have the, moves, uh, the movements of people. Another interesting finding was that when we use the combined model that was using both mobile network features and census features, only six out of the 68 features were census features. The, the model automatically selects the features, and it only selected six out of 68 coming from the more traditional variables. And interestingly, the ones that were selected have actually found in previous work to be correlated with crime. So our empirical uh, sort of like evidence is also corroborating some of the previous work that wasn't done empirically. It was done uh, using observations and questionnaires. And then to wrap up, actually, uh, when did, what time did we start, sorry? Uh, I think I have five minutes left, yeah. So I'll, I'll cover very quickly the last area where I think this data can bring value, which is in public health. In fact, and you might have read some of this already in the newspapers, uh, one of the biggest concerns in terms of uh, the survival of the species, so to say, is actually the risk of an extremely lethal pandemic that could uh, wipe out uh, a big percentage of all of us on the, on the planet Earth. And this is like uh, an article from the International Monetary Fund saying that the pandemic risk is one of the global uh, threats uh, of the next century. So there is a lot of concerns about how we will respond to a pandemic. And you've seen what happened with Ebola last year and, and, and how much of a crisis you know, it was. So the question is, can we use this data to help in the context of a pandemic? And the answer is yes. And I'm just going to share with you very quickly what we did when the H1N1 flu outbreak happened in Mexico in 2009, which I don't know if you remember. Uh, so in 2009, there was the first 
H1N1 flu outbreak in the history, and actually the first pandemic in the 21st history, in the 20, 21st century. Uh, and I'm just gonna quickly give you an overview of what happened during the first days of the outbreak. So at around April 17, 2009, the first confirmed cases of flu were detected and the government declared a state of medical alert, which wasn't, it was just a recommendation. It wasn't any kind of intervention where they recommended people to stay home because there was a risk that there was this flu going on and it was a pretty dangerous flu. However, the number of confirmed cases continued to increase and there was pressure on the government to do something stronger than just a recommendation. And what we did is they raised the alert level to a second level of alert on April 24th and they closed the schools and universities and they closed some of the touristy sites. Uh, they also closed the port of calls in Mexico from the cruise ships. And uh, they, for example, also forbid people from going to mass or going to um, big um, sort of like soccer stadiums to see uh, soccer matches and so forth. However, the number of confirmed cases, cases continued to increase. So on May 1st, they did something that was extremely unprecedented, which was they sort of like shut down all non-essential activities in the country, which meant everything except for hospitals and firemen and police. And this closure lasted five days, but unfortunately, about a month later, the World Health Organization declared that there was a world uh, pandemic of H1N1 flu. So one of the questions that stayed in the air was, what was the impact of all these measures that the government took? Did they actually help in any way? Because at the end, the disease spread. So was it a waste of money doing all of this? Did it help? And this, this is what we answered with our data. So what we did was we took um, a million of anonymous uh, phones from one of the most affected areas in Mexico, and we characterized the mobility of those phones before the flu and during each of the alert periods. Because for an infectious disease to become a pandemic, people need to move. If, there was, if I was infectious right now and I just stay put in my house, uh, my disease doesn't become a pandemic because I'm not moving. So mobility is key when there is a risk of a pandemic. And that's why a lot of the interventions are focused on reducing the mobility of the population. And the interventions that the government took were aiming reducing, at reducing the, the mobility of the population. So thanks to the existence of the mobile data, we can actually quantify if indeed the population reduced their mobility or not. And this is what we found. I'll just skip this. If we look at each of the different levels of alert, we found some surprising uh, things. First of all, we found that there was zero significant reduction in mobility during the recommendation period. So during this period, the mobility of the people was roughly the same as if there was no alert. So one of the first conclusions is recommendations from the government don't seem to be very effective because people just kind of continue with their lives. The second finding was that during the second level of alert, 80% of the people significantly reduced their mobility, whereas only 55% of the people significantly reduced their mobility during the third period of alert. However, this period of alert was much more costly for the government than this period of alert. So another important finding was closing schools and universities during working days because this period happened during working days and this one happened during holidays. It's more effective than imposing much more severe restrictions but during the holiday period because it seems that during the holiday period people don't, the measures are not as effective. And then the last, the last question that we answered was, was this reduction sufficient to delay the progression of the disease. So to do that, we applied a state-of-the-art uh, computational epidemiologic model, which is called the SEIR model, where you have a lot of agents and the agents can be in susceptible uh, state or exposed to the infection, then become infectious and then they are recovered and you have different rates for the probability of going into uh, different, uh, each of these different phases. And then what we did is, I'll just go quickly through this, we use the mobility model coming from the mobility data, from the mobile data, the social network model coming also from the mobile data, and the disease model being this S um, EIR model. And we put all that into a simulation of the progression of the disease, and we ran two simulations. The first one, assuming there was no intervention from the government, so the mobility was the same all the time. And a second uh, model where the mobility was the reduced mobility because of the interventions. 
And what we found was that the number of infected people and the peak of the infection was about 10% smaller and about 40 hours later, thanks to the measures that the government took. And then, of course, the question is, is that enough? Is that a lot? So 10% represents you know, hundreds of thousands of people, potentially. And 40 hours, when you are dealing with a crisis, is a lot of time because it, help, it gives you time to order more medication or to empty more beds or to mobilize more medical um, personnel. So it's not a neglectable amount of time. I'm just going to finish here because uh, I don't have time. But maybe I'll just quickly mention three areas where I think there is still a lot of challenges for how to use this data in general and in particular for social good and for the public sector. The first set of challenges are related to regulatory and social challenges. So there is a lot of uh, not up-to-date regulation, there are potential unintended consequences, and there is also the potential risk of, of creating a digital divide between the people that have access to the, this data and the people that don't have access to this data. There are many technical challenges, which is very exciting for us as researchers, so there are a lot of problems related to how this will generalize, how you combine data from different sources. Of course, all we are finding are correlations. So if you want to attribute any kind of causal effect, you need to do interventions. Uh, many challenges in terms of the features that you select and machine learning. And then, of course, there are potential privacy and security risks depending on how careful people are when they are dealing with this data. And with this, I will just finish. This is some of the uh, relevant papers that uh, you can also look online for them. And as I promised, I said at the beginning that we are hiring. So if any of you is graduating and is interested in applying, please go to this website and enter your information there. Thank you. <laughs>